So I was asked to say a few words this morning um, about why I give to CSL Dallas. And in thinking about it, um, two things came up for me that I wanted to share a little bit about with you this morning. And the first is, is that CSL Dallas is my spiritual home. Um, and I choose to support my home um, and my family. I came here to CSL Dallas for the first time in 2008, about seven years ago. And um, I knew that this was where I belonged. I really resonated with the teachings and um, it, it was what I had been looking for for a very long time. So I, of course, started taking classes and getting involved. And then, you know, I started realizing how powerful these teachings are and how they really work and actually saw how they were showing up in my life. Um, and there's just been such transformation in my life during this time. It's been permanent change. It's been profound change. And one thing that I know is that I am in the driver's seat. I get to choose each day to co-create my life with spirit. And I get to decide exactly what that looks like each day. Um, and then and that's been very powerful um, and it's led to a lot of changes in my life. So I'm so grateful for that. And, um, and I know that everybody here has been for, here for me during that time through celebrations, through sadness. Um, I've always been supported and um, you guys have been here to know the truth when sometimes I can't remember it. Um, and now I've gone through a lot of training and now I'm a licensed practitioner and I'm able to um, give back in even more ways and to participate actively here at the center. Um, so then the second reason um, that is important to me in terms of giving is that tithing really is a spiritual practice for me. Um, that's something that we teach here at the center and that's something that I really feel um, passionately about. And I know that when I am fully grounded in my own financial prosperity, then that, you know, I get to reap the benefits from that, but then that also allows me to give back to the center. Um, and, and I want to give back, and I want CSL Dallas to continue to thrive. So we also teach that money is spirit in action. Um, money's energy, it's, it's a mechanism, it's a tool through which things manifest. And so, yes, it keeps the lights on, it pays the bills, but it also opens the doors to opportunities and growth here at the center. And so I want to participate in that. I want to keep that truth in my consciousness. I want to see spirit in action, and that includes seeing spirit as money in action. Um, and so I give to be a part of that. And then the last thing that I want to say is I just want to stand here with everybody today and say that I know my truth and I know all of your truth and our truth collectively at CSL Dallas, that we are abundant and we are prosperous. Um, and I am fully committed to CSL Dallas as a practitioner, as a member, and, and I just want all of you to know that, that I'm in. Um, I have my button. I put my pledge. <laughs> and so I ask all of you to join me um, in tithing to CSL Dallas. I'm so grateful and so happy to be here, and I just want to thank each and every one of you for all that you do. Um, thank you. Today, Marsha is going to talk about our diversity initiative for next year. I want to share a little bit personally of what this really means to me. I was raised in an inner city up until I was about 13 years old. It was all black. And we moved at 13 to an uh, all-white suburb. When I lived in the inner city and went to inner city schools, there were a few white families or white kids, uh, which you know the black kids made fun of and, and ostracized. When we moved to the white neighborhood, I saw it from the re reverse side because those families, they told their kids not to play with us. And so I see both sides of the coin. And I realized that as I have lived my life and get to know people, which at CSL Dallas, by taking the classes and getting to know people on the personal, uh, um, personal level, that the color doesn't matter. You get to know me, I get to know you, and you get to know who we are. And that's what this initiative uh, is, we're looking to, um, to do with this initiative. So uh, thank you for that. So we'd just like to wrap up by all of you join us again in unison and state okay. our, our goals together. $708,000 and 205 pledges and beyond.
so much Jeannie how lovely all right well it's just truly my honor and privilege to introduce to you our speaker our speaker today is a wonderful presenter who learned much of what she knows about business from growing up as the youngest of 10 children in Hawaii differentiating herself in the shadow of nine siblings required her to develop and use the sales and negotiating skills that she is famous for today Mae McCarthy has become the quintessential serial entrepreneur, starting at the age of six when she got her first lesson in food inventory shrinkage as her brothers literally ate her profits. <laughs> However, the past 32 years, May has used metaphysical and science of mind spiritual principles to grow six successful businesses in a variety of industries with the largest having more than 250 employees and over 100 million in annual revenues. May is a member of the Center for Spiritual Living in Seattle and the younger sister of a minister there, Reverend Sharon Ramey. She is here today to emphasize the importance of connecting with spirit as your source to achieve greater levels of success, happiness, and freedom. Please welcome May McCarthy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so happy to be here. I love Dallas. In my last company, I got a chance to come to Dallas and, and Texas a lot because we had a lot of customers here. So therefore, there are very smart people in Dallas. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. How many of you here would like to have more money? Okay, um, how about who here would like to have great health? Okay, and how about harmonious relationships with family, friends, coworkers, communities? Okay, good. Well, you're in the right place. And if you didn't raise your hand, you can have a nice, wonderful meditation for the next 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I am so happy to be here. As I was introduced, I am the last of 10 kids, and I learned an awful lot um, by being raised in, in Hawaii. And I also am a huge, huge fan of Florence Scovel Shin. I've been practicing metaphysical and new thought uh, spiritual principles for 34 years. When I was 18, my mother gave me a book by Florence Scovel Shin called The Game of Life. Anybody know it? Yeah? Published in 1925. Now, my mother is a devout Catholic. 
who actually converted from Seventh-day Adventist. And here comes along her 10th child, and she says, Oh, honey, I think this is for you. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. I use that book and those principles to do all sorts of amazing things, but I didn't realize that I was doing amazing things. It just seemed fun. It felt like a game. It really, truly is a game of life. Why? Because I don't have to do everything myself. I have a spiritual partner that can help me. I affectionately call my spiritual partner the chief spiritual officer, or CSO. And I have to tell you, I have one of my former employees here because I actually had the CSO in our company and placed it on the top of our org chart. And all of our employees would look at that and go, who's the CSO? Do we get to meet them? See, as a C CSO, it, for me, is that characteristic of spirit that gives me the most valuable advice ever. Most valuable advice. And as a CEO, I surround myself with people whose advice I value. I have a chief financial officer that advises our company on finances, a chief information officer that that understands all the technical capabilities of our company and our needs, a chief operations officer who will guide and direct us in terms of operations for the company. So it stood to reason that I would have a chief spiritual officer, which represents the ultimate advisor who knows everything. And I brought it into the sweet seat and put it at the top of the org chart so that I, as the CEO, reported to it. Now here's the interesting thing. In our company, we had lots and lots of diversity, lots. We had every age, race, gender, um, even spiritual background. Lots of different traditions in our company, but no one was offended by this idea of chief spiritual officer. When asked, what role does the chief spiritual officer play? My response was simply that it will advise us and guide us to reach our goals. It will show up sometimes as intuition, a gut feeling, a feeling in your heart, maybe a thought that just flew into your head randomly. All right? So it's going to show up in a lot of different ways, but we can expect to be a miracle-making company. We can expect to compete with companies that are much larger than ours and achieve success. Not only were we a miracle-making company, but it was really fun to see these paths that we were led on by spirit to achieve our goals. So as I mentioned, the CSO shows up and, and provides advice to get to achieve goals, but it stands to reason that you actually have to have some goals for it to work on. Not only can it help you achieve financial success and relationship success, but it also can help you in a number of other areas. In, in 1994, the CSO actually saved my life. I had this thought, this flash of my sister's face in my mind's eye. Anybody ever have that happen? You'll just have a really strong thought of someone or a picture of their face in your mind's eye? Well, I knew, of course, practicing this, that that meant that I needed to go contact my sister. And I happened to be really close to her office. So I just stopped by. She was so happy. Oh my gosh. She was so happy because she had a computer problem which I could fix for free. <laughs> so as I'm sitting at her workstation with my legs crossed, she noticed this little tiny dark spot on the outside of my right leg. And she said, what is that? Well, you heard in the introduction that I was raised in Hawaii, right? And I'm fair. So I said it was a freckle. She said she didn't feel that it was a freckle and that I needed to contact her dermatologist and have it looked at. Well, I was just about to tell her not to worry. You have no cause for worry. My gut wrenched. 
Anybody ever feel your gut have pain trying to get your attention? Don't know why, it just is, right? So my gut wrenched, and because I've been practicing this a while, I knew that meant for me to stop and just do as she said. So I made the appointment, went to the doctor, and he said it was nothing, nothing to worry about. It's too small. It's really nothing. You'll be fine. Well, I was raised as the last child of a surgeon. And surgeons feel that they are almost right on the same level as God. <laughs> no offense to any surgeons here, but you're probably going, yes, that's true. <laughs> so my father trained us not to uh, give any sort of feedback to a doctor's uh, prescription or advice that we were supposed to just take it, that they knew more than we did. Okay? So here, this doctor, who's been doing this for a very long time and has seen a lot of different things, tells me that it's nothing to worry about. Go home. My gut wrenched again. So I built up that courage and I said, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you have to cut it out. I came back a week later to a diagnosis of malignant melanoma Clark's level three. Yeah. The CSO through intuition saved my life. How many of you here have a lot of faith in spirit operating in your lives and in the lives of others for healing? Yeah? Hundreds, thousands of stories about spirit interceding and providing miraculous and wonderful healing. We have that one down. Somebody calls us and says, I need prayer. We're there. We're there. We can pray. We can know the truth that you are, in fact, perfectly healthy with every cell in your body filled with healed light. We got that one down, right? But I can tell you that this also works for your finances and for your relationships and for anything else that you want in life. We can have that same kind of experience of knowing unconditionally that we will be guided if we choose to. So intuition is gonna show up in a number of different ways, as I described, but it's gonna show up always to help you achieve a goal or to keep you safe. There are a number of famous, famous, wealthy, successful people who have claimed that intuition has been a tool for success. Bill Gates says that often you have to rely on intuition. And Steve Jobs agreed when he said, you have to have courage, courage to follow your heart and intuition. And Oprah Winfrey has stated that she has listened to that still, small voice of intuition her entire life. And the only times that she's made mistakes, when she didn't listen. So if Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Oprah, Dr. Wayne Dyer, Thomas Edison, and thousands of other really successful people have said that it's important to follow intuition as a success tool, why aren't we all doing it? Why aren't we all doing it? That could be, yeah. We're not taught to. And thank God for centers like this that do teach these principles. But most of us are not taught to recognize that still small voice. The other thing that's really interesting is that we live in such a world of data. We want to see it. We want to measure it. We want to evaluate it and analyze it. We want to talk to all of our friends and get their opinion on it before we make a decision. Okay, who else, who else besides me has been guilty of that? Huh? Right. So if it doesn't make sense, if our rational mind can't make sense of it, we disregard it. 
This means yes, may I understand. Yes. So that's what ends up happening. Albert Einstein put it perfectly when he said that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And the rational mind, that one that loves data, is a faithful servant. But somehow we've created this society that honors the servant or the rational mind and has forgotten the gift. So what I'm here to do today is to remind you to remember to remember that this is a gift. And it's available for all of us to use. And here's the best part. It's really, really simple. I've even, as a self-proclaimed efficiency expert, I've even given you a cheat sheet that we can use. Does everybody have a handout that looks like this? If you don't, raise your hand and one will be brought to you. OK? So there's just three simple things for you to remember, to remember about using this gift. The first thing is that you can partner with it, that it wants to help you to achieve all of your goals and your desires and your dreams and to keep you safe. But you have to have some goals and you have to have those goals in the right form in order for, to enable intuition to show up more obviously and more often for you to use. How many of you here have heard one of your friends say something like, I want to lose 10 pounds? Yeah? Yeah? Or, I want to get out of debt? Yeah? OK. Well, let's think about that goal for a second. I want to lose 10 pounds. The goal is to be wanting to lose 10 pounds. Hmm. That means you have to be 10 pounds overweight to make that statement true. A better, a better goal would be, I am so grateful that I am physically fit and trim and toned and healthy and strong. And that I'm in a pain-free body that's easily able to go hiking and walking with my friends and family. And we have so much fun. And I'm eternally youthful and increasingly more beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's a goal, right? <laughs> and then if you say something like, I want to be debt-free, remember, to be debt-free means you have to be in debt, right? Right, so better, a better goal would be, I'm so grateful that I am financially free. I am well supported and provided for, and I easily and joyfully am able to have enough money coming in, I would put a dollar amount on there, to easily afford my living and my giving to my center and my entertainment expenses. See the difference? So having a goal worded as though you've already achieved it with gratitude is very, very important. That's part of that first, first part of this talk. The second step is that you can partner with this source of intuition. And I find it really helpful to be able to give that characteristic of spirit that guides you and directs you and gives you advice that's valuable. Give it a name. That is not saying that there's any separation, all right? In Science of Mind and New Thought, we call spirit by a number of different characteristic names. Love, power, truth, peace, divine intelligence. So give that characteristic of spirit that is the supreme advisor a name. And you can write it down on your sheet. Now, in this practice, you're going to have different roles and responsibilities. In this partnership, you have your job to do, and Spirit or your CSO has its job to do. Your job is to figure out what it is that you want and be grateful for having received it in advance. 
Spirit's job is to create the path to get there. Now, be honest. How many of you are overachievers here? You want to create the goal and every single step that it takes to get to the result. Mm, no one else has been guilty of that, really? Seriously? Right, right. No, but that's the way it works. We want to create a goal and then every single step that it takes to achieve it. No, no, no. Stop doing that. You don't get to do that anymore. Your job is to be grateful for having achieved it in advance. Spirit's job is to create the path and give you one step to take at a time. Just one. You either take the step or ask for another lead or another sign or another message or something that confirms whether or not you're supposed to take that step. And let me give you an example. Um, in my last company, we were really small and, and working hard to try and make it. And our goal, the goal that I had laid out, was to have a minimum of $400,000 in revenue into the company by a particular period of time. Okay. So I'm writing that out every single morning as part of my goal attainment practice, which takes about 25 minutes every morning. I arrived in Cleveland, and I have a drill. I travel about 150,000 miles a year. So I land at the airport, I go to the rent-a-car counter, get my car, drive to my hotel, drop off my bags, and then go to the closest grocery store. It's about five minutes away. I get water and supplies that I need for my stay. Well, I'm sitting in the car, getting ready to go to the store, and I get this really strong thought to go to a grocery store that's 15 minutes away instead of the one that's five minutes away. So here comes the rational mind, May, 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 May. It's 9 o'clock at night. Your appointment is tomorrow morning at 8, which is really 5 o'clock in the morning Seattle time. You should not be spending this extra time to drive to a grocery store across town. It makes no sense. The one that's five minutes away has water and supplies. Anybody identifying with this? Yeah? Okay. So it's saying don't do it. That's what the rational mind does. It tries to talk us out of it. So you need to just stomp your foot and say, no. CSO, I need another lead. Then the intuitive mind starts showing up. Well, it's only an extra 20 minutes. I mean, you're going to probably stay awake for an extra 20 minutes anyway. So you might as well just make the drive because I told you to. I mean, what's the worst thing in the world that could happen? Hey, maybe the water and the supplies will be on sale. And you'll make, you know, it'll be worth it. Okay, so the intuitive mind kicks in. So I made the drive. And as I parked the car, and as I'm walking into the store, guess who should be walking out at exactly the same time? A potential customer that I met six months before at a trade show who was not returning any of my calls. <laughs> Hi, how are you? And we strike up this conversation. And during that conversation, I'm invited to come and make a presentation to their group while I'm in town. Well, that led to another presentation, which led to another one. And we were able to secure a contract within that period of time for over half a million dollars. Okay, let me ask you a question. Now, be honest with me. How many of you overachievers would say, okay, my goal is to have a minimum of $400,000 in revenue. So I'm going to drive to a grocery store at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> Come on. Does that make any sense at all? Of course not. But that's the way God works. Does that kind of sound like Red Seas parting, food falling from heaven, water coming out of rocks, beyond my imagination. That's the way this works, and it gets to be really fun. It actually does turn into a game, because you just don't know what path the CSO is going to create, but you do know that you're going to achieve your goals or something better. So you have your role. You're grateful for what you want as though you already have it. 
CSO creates the path and gives you one lead to take a step at a time. You either take the step or ask for another lead. Eventually, you reach your goals. That's the whole process. But how do you know? How do you know when it's spirit talking to you? Well, the only way you can do that is with the third point. And the third point says that you have to meet regularly with your CSO every single day. And we don't have enough time today for me to go over this daily meeting practice, but it is available in my book. And we're also going to actually practice it in the workshop this afternoon. We're going to get a chance to actually go through all the seven steps that you use every day. But it takes just 25 to 30 minutes in the morning. And then it's just fun all day long. It's just really, really fun. You get to have a life that is filled with more joy and more ease because you don't have to do everything yourself. You just don't. So every day you're going to meet with your CSO and develop that confidence, develop that relationship, just like you have with anyone else in your life. It takes a little bit of time, but you will get there. The other benefit is that as you have this wonderful relationship, you don't have to go through these emotional roller coaster rides anymore. Life happens. Stuff shows up. Law enforcement officers walk into your office to arrest employees. <laughs> Fortune 20 companies sue you out of the blue. But you don't have to have it be a crisis and get all your prayer posse together and freak out and, and pray the problem, okay? You will know without a shadow of a doubt that all you have to do is decide what your good is. Ernest Holmes and, and Emma Curtis Hopkins said that there is a good for you and you ought to have it. And I would add that you should have it now. You should have it now, right? And this practice will help you to do that. And so just in closing, what I'd love to do is for on your sheet here, at the very bottom, we have a closing prayer. And this is what Ernest Holmes has to say about this idea of spiritual partnership. And I'd love for us to read it together. I know that I am in partnership with the infinite. I identify myself with this partnership, knowing that it always leads to success. I accept that the action of infinite intelligence is back of everything. It is always manifesting itself, and it now does so through the thought pattern of success that I am establishing for myself. Conditions and situations about me now start to correspond to my new ideas about them. The invisible presence and power indwelling and surrounding me, which is forever making manifest my thought, now creates for me the success with which I have identified my thought. There is a good for you, and you ought to have it. You should have it now. May you be blessed. May you be prospered and healthy and happy in all areas of your life always. Thank you so much.